if you accept this, that the national spirit of Judaism, of the Jews, is divine, so if I'm a patriot immigrating to Israel, building kibbutzim, I'm doing all that, devotion to the Jewish people is not a substitute to devotion for God, it is devotion to God. The Tikva Fund presents a lecture by Mika Goodman. Is Zionism Messianic? The debate over the soul of religious Zionism was delivered in August 2016 in New York City. Dr. Goodman is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and the CEO in Rosh Midrashah at Ein Prat. He's the author of four books. The Dream of the Kuzari was published in 2012. Moses' Last Speech was published in 2014. His award-winning book on Maimonides, Secrets of the God of the Perplexed, was published in Hebrew in 2010 and translated into English as Maimonides and the Book that Changed Judaism, Secrets of the God for the Perplexed. Dr. Goodman's most recent book is Catch 67, published in 2017. So building a connection between socialism and Zionism wasn't easy, but Nachman Sirkin, Borukhov, Katzenelson, they built that synthesis. It seems like building a connection between religion and Zionism is a lot harder. And today in the lecture, I'll try to explain why is, it such, why is it hard to glue religion to Zionism and how did they pull that off? And they're going to be focusing on one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook. And the glue he used, the theological glue he used in order to match Zionism with religion was messianic glue. And when you use a messianic idea, to melt Zionism and religion and to create something new altogether. So what came out as a very great, grand, charismatic idea that as we're talking is facing serious theological problems in Israel. So that's a story we're, try we're gonna try to tell today. The messianic interpretation that led to the merge of Zionism and religion and the results of that interpretation. Religion and Zionism, they don't really fit together. I'll try to explain why, because in a deep sense, religion is many things, it's also an interpretation of, of time and of history. Now how did Jews, in very broad strokes, interpret their moment in history throughout all those years in exile? Let's say you're in the 11th century in Ashkenaz, where Germany is today or 14th century in Morocco. How do you understand your moment in history? How do you understand it? So religion gives you language, it gives you categories to understand this moment in history. And what's the main category that you use to understand why am I here in Morocco in the 14th century? Why am I here? According to the religious narrative, why are we here? We're here because we're punished. Tisha B'Av is just around the corner. Mipnei chata'einu galilnu me'arzenu v'idrachaknu me'al admetenu Because of our sins, we were punished. And the punishment was exile. So why am I here, 14th century in Morocco? Because I'm punished. So this concept that you send someone to exile, you change their location as a punishment, is something that comes very intuitive to us, but think how not intuitive it is. You meet a Jew in the 14th century in Morocco, what are you doing here? I'm punished. <laughs> I'm just punished, that's why. Now, oh, you're punished for what? What did you do? No, it's not me. It was, it was uh, 1,400 years ago. Um, they didn't, I, I guess they weren't nice to each other or something, so I'm here now. <laughs> So the notion that my location is a punishment means that I'm punished for a sin that I didn't commit. The sin was committed in the past, which means that according to this interpretation of history, my life is controlled by the past. 1,400 years ago, some people, which I don't know who they were really, did something wrong, and now I'm punished. And till when am I going to be here? Till when? Until there'll be divine intervention in history and, and the punishment will end and I'll return back home, back to my land. 
So let's put this together. I'm controlled by a past. I'm passive. I am waiting for it to end. I don't know when it will end. Rabbis always speculate when it will end using all these ways to speculate. By the way, they always get it wrong. It's not, we don't know when the punishment is going to end. And the only way to end it is by just really wanting it to end. There's nothing you can do. It's divine intervention that will end it. Meaning now, so if when we use the religious narrative to interpret this moment in history, it creates a very passive attitude. So you can understand how religion, in the eyes of the founding fathers of Zionism, creates a very passive attitude. How does Zionism interpret history? <laughs> Why are you sitting now in the Galut, wherever you are? Why are you in exile? Are you punished for a sin while are you in exile? Well, this is how Zionism turned it around. According to the classical Zionist narrative, let's say Berdichevsky, which we've used yesterday, it's not that I'm in exile as a punishment for a sin, but the fact that I'm in exile, that is the sin. You follow me? Being in exile is not a punishment for the sin. It's the sin. The fact that you're passively sitting there, waiting, that's the problem. That's not the result of the sin. That is the sin. You're not supposed to wait for divine intervention. You're supposed to take initiative and end this stage in history. So Zionism is about awakening the Jews. It's about moving from a passive mentality to an active mentality. It's understanding that you're not controlled by your past. You are creating your own future. And that is why they thought that religion is the great enemy of Zionism. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. You probably heard many, many times the narrative that it's Jewish religion that kept us alive in exile, right? You heard that narrative? If it wasn't for the religion, if it wasn't for the faith, if it wasn't for, for the mitzvot, for the rituals, if it wasn't for all that, the Jews wouldn't survive in diaspora, in the exile. Well, according to the Zionist narr Berdichevsky narrative, it's not, that, it's not that because of Judaism we survived in the exile, but it's because of Judaism we were in the exile. And the only way to, if that's true, if it's the Jewish narrative and Jewish, that, that, that cult constantly cultivates political passivity, the only way to awaken the Jews, to install a sense that they own their destiny, that they own, that they could, that they could direct their history, the only way to do that is how? to shake off religion. So you understand if religion cultivates passivity and Zionism is about activating, the, activating politically the Jewish people, so religion and Zionism, they can't be connected. So this was one last argument for secular Zionism. In 1902, an important scholar and thinker called Rabbi Yaakov Reines thought that, that we should and we could connect Zionism to religion in the following way. The following way. Which category does Reines use in order to enable Orthodox Jews to join Zionism? What category does he use? Well, as you all know, halachically, the notion of pikuach nefesh, of saving your life or other people's lives, is a notion that almost always prevails. So even if Zionism is led by secular Israelis, secular Jews, and Zionism might not have, is, is not very religious, not very orthodox, it's not very in line with what we believe in, if Zionism has a chance to save Jews, so halachically, 
we have to join Zionism, right? So precisely because Zionism is a response to anti-Semitism, if it's a response to anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is a constant threat to Jewish, li to Jewish lives, so we are obligated to join Zionism. But the kind of connection that this, this is in 1902. Yaakov Reines creates the ideas that enables Orthodox Jews to join, to join Zionism using the category of pikuach nefesh. But for this to work, Zionism has to be political. Has to have no claim about Jewish identity. Has to be stripped from any fantasy of curing the Jew, liberating the Jew from his past. Zionism is only about creating a safe haven, about protecting Jews from anti-Semites. Has nothing to do with the revival of Judaism. Because if Zionism is about revival of Judaism, so a good Orthodox Jew can join Zionism. Why? What? Judaism revival. And if Zionism is going to try to start playing with Judaism, so Zionism is like the before movement, right? It has a claim on Judaism. But as long as Zionism is not about Judaism, but about Jews, then Orthodox Jews could join it. Ironically, it's the secular, political character of Zionism that enables religious Jews to join it. You follow that? It's because, Rhinus argues, because Zionism is secular, because it's indifferent to Judaism, because it couldn't care about Judaism, because it's only about Jews and not Judaism, Orthodox Jews can join it. So ironically, because Zionism is secular, so religious Jews can join it. Did you follow this? As a result, the kind of religious Zionism that is created by Yaakov Rhinus is a religious Zionism that works like this. It's not that my religion is national. And it's not that my Zionism is religious. It's that I am a Zionist and I'm religious. I'm a Zionist and I'm religious, but my Zionism and my religion have nothing to do with each other. I happen to be a Zionist, and I'm, so it's not that my Zionism is religious, but I'm a Zionist that is religious. That's the religious Zionism of Yaakov Reines, founded in 1902, joins, and he's, and out of all the forces in Zionism, Yaakov Reines is the greatest ally of who? Think about it. The most secular form of Zionism. The one that has no claim about Judaism, only about setting the Jews. So their natural ally is the most secular Zionist. Like the classic reading of Hansen, Zionism has nothing to do with Judaism. It's saving the Jewish family Semites. He's the classic category of pikuach nefesh Zionism. So political Zionism is pikuach, halachically, is pikuach nefesh Zionism. So the great best ally of Herzl is Zionist. And in 1903, when Uganda is on the table, who does Zionist vote with? What? Yaakov Reines votes for the Uganda plan. Now, if you think about it, it's very weird, and yet it makes sense. It was the religious Zionists that were for the Uganda plan. Why? It's about saving Jews. It doesn't matter where it is. It's not an attempt to return to our past, to revive our Judaism. It's because it's stripped from ambition about our Judaism that's legitimate for us to join Zionism. So the Uganda plan works. And ironically, you know, Yaakov Vanes is the founder of the first religious Zionist party, which is called the Mizrahi. The Mizrahi is a party that later on will merge with another party called Hapo El HaMizrahi and will create the Miflaga Datit Leumit called Mafdal. Later on, the Mavdal will turn into the Baita Yehudi, which will later turn into Naftali Bennett. <laughs> so if you think about it, it took 100 years. Today, the political descendants of the party, you see, the political descendants of the party, of the Mizrahi, today, they're the ones, what do they think of trading land for peace, leaving land of, leaving, giving up land of Eretz Yisrael? What do the political descendants of Vinus, what, how do they feel about that? Well, under no circumstances, not one inch. Now think of the irony, think of the irony that today 
Religious Zionism is not, not giving up one inch of Eretz Yisrael, but the starting point, they weren't willing to give up an inch of Eretz Yisrael, they were willing to give up Eretz Yisrael. Now the question is, what happened? How did they move from a willingness to give up everything to a reality where you can't give up nothing? This has a lot to do with the story I'm going to try to tell, tell you today. Now this kind of religious Zionism, Zionism I want to call it, religious Zionism, the model of coexistence, where I'm religious, I'm a Zionist, and they're, they're, these two elements of my identity are living with each other in coexistence, but they're not really connected to each other. They can't be. This model was a dominant model in Israel for religious Zionists from the foundation of the Mizrahi in 1902 until the 1970s. This was a dominant identity for religious Zionists. Not the only one, but a dominant one. I mean, most of them maybe didn't really learn Yaakov Reines. They couldn't articulate it. But this is how many religious Zionists experienced their identity, their dual identity. I'm a religious, I'm a Zionist. My Zionism is not very religious, and my religion is not nationalist. And, but in the turn of the 20th century, there was another rabbi, another great thinker, probably the greatest Jewish thinker in the 20th century, that had an alternative way of thinking of religious Zionism, a radical alternative. His name was Rav Kook, Rav Avraham Yitzchak Cohen Kook. And his understanding was that Zionism and religion, they're not living together in one identity and coexistence, but they are different aspects of the same thing itself. Our religion is nationalistic, and my Zionism is religion. And the way he and, and the category, one of the categories that he used to explain this connection was the category of geula, of redemption. Let me try to explain. I'll do my best to explain how he how he understood this. If Judaism throughout the generations cultivates an expectation, one day things will change, one day redemption will come. So what's supposed to happen? What's the great plan? What's supposed to happen one day? According to the classic Jewish narrative, how is history going to end? How is everything going to come together in the end? How is all our misery going to be balanced with the glory of the end of days? How is this going to happen? How is this play, going to be played out? So the prophets of Israel, Isaiah, Yechezkel, Yirmiyahu, Amos, they all repeated different aspects of the same grand divine plan. And what's the plan? How's it going to happen? What's supposed to happen? How is history going to, how is exile going to end? How is everything going to work out? What's the grand plan as echoed by the prophets and echoed again in the Talmud in, in Perik Chelek and Masechet Sanhedrin? What's the grand plan? How's it going to happen? Very simply put, all the prophets, the prophets, what do they say? They say, one day the people of Israel will return to the land of Israel. And another take on the prophets, the people of Israel will return to the God of Israel. Veshavta ad Hashem Elohecha, veshamata bekolo, vemal Hashem Elohecha levavcha. There's going to be a return to God. There's going to be a return to the land. Return, how do you say return in Hebrew? Tshuva. There's going to be tshuva, a shiva, a return to Eretz Yisrael. And there's going to be a tshuva, a return to Elohei Yisrael. It's, the future has a double tshuva waiting for us. We're going to return to the land. We're going to return to God. And it's all part of a great plan. This is what's going to happen. Okay. Now we're in the end of the 19th century. And the Jewish people wake up and build a national awareness. And there's the Aliyah Rishona and the Aliyah Shnia and World War I and Balfour Declaration and the Aliyah Shlishit. And it seems like the plan is starting to implement itself. The people of Israel from all exiles, from all corners of earth are waking up and they are all returning to Eretz Yisrael. Meaning the prophecies are not that were written in the past are describing the present. It's happening. It's a reality. There's only one problem. The people that are leading the return to Eretz Yisrael, 
They themselves, what are they doing? They're rejecting the God of Israel. The Berdichevskis, the Brenners, even the Echad Ams, by the way. So how can it be that the people that are implementing the grand plan are violating the same plan? How could it be that the pioneers that are fulfilling the ancient prophecies are destroying the ancient prophecies? See, this is a prop. If when we use religion to interpret history, when it comes to Zionism, the result is a paradox. Because the tshuva to Eretz Yisrael is not led by people who are returning to the God of Israel, but it's led by people who are rebelling against the God of Israel. And ironically, the people that are devoted to the God of Israel, what are they doing? They're not involved in the return to the land of Israel. So how do you, so how do we deal with this reality? And the Rav Cook, what part of the work of the Rav Cook is to explain this conflict, this tension. So what Rav Cook, Rav Cook offered an interpretation of secularism. And in so many layers and so many aspects, Rav Cook's theology is an attempt to interpret secularism. Now, before I say this, I want to say one thing about interpreting history. According to the Rav Cook, the role of the tzaddikim, of the, of the uh, mystics of every generation, is not only to interpret sacred texts, it's also to interpret sacred history. Now, I think you all know, what does it mean when a mystic interprets the sacred text? How does a mystic interpret the sacred text? It's the assumption that the, um, the pshat, the most transparent layer of the text, is not the only layer of meaning in the text. Many times, it's only, it covers deep layers. And those deep layers, the sky's deep layers, and the, the text, the Torah, has secrets hidden deep inside the Torah. This is a very important Jewish tradition. Now let's apply that on history. The events you see there, the pshat, the events of history, that's the, their transparent meaning is not their only meaning. Behind the transparent meaning, there is more meaning, and behind the more meaning, there is the secrets of history. And the role of the mystic is not only to expose the secrets of the sacred text, his role is also to expose the secret of sacred events of history. So imagine you have to now interpret history and find the secrets behind the events. And this is the role of the Rav Kook, the way he, that's how he understood his role, to be the grand interpreter of history, to explain to all of us that, seems that, that things are not the way they seem to be, that beyond the events there's always more. There's always a secret. There's always a hidden message. And the most important event that Rav Kook had to interpret as a mystic and to expose that there's more than meets the eye is the process of secularization. How do you explain the paradox of secular Zionism? The movement returning, fulfilling the divine plan is the movement violating the divine plan. How do you explain that? And according to Rav Kook, secularism is a movement of tshuva. <laughs> the rebellion against God is an attempt to return to God, is a result of an unconscious yearning for God. That means secular Israelis are, what are they? According to this, what are they? They are subconsciously burn, having burning with religion. And they don't know it. They have, they're attracted to God, but they don't know that they're attracted to God. Because in their awareness, they think they're rejecting Him, but in their subconscious, they're attracted to Him. 
By the way, some people didn't really like this move. Secular Israelis always felt that this is very, very condescending, patronizing. Haredim didn't like it either. They say it's gnevat dat. You're saying that you understand secularism more than secular, the secularism itself. But Rav Cook thought that he understood something. Now, I want to use here maybe a category from psychoanalysis. So what is, what's supposed, I mean, hypothetically, what's supposed to happen in uh, Freudian therapy? What's supposed to happen? The assumption of a Freudian therapy is that what really motivates me to do thing, certain things I do, what's really motivating me is a burning passion that I'm not even aware of. There's a gap between what I think I want and what I really want, and what am I supposed to, and, and doing therapy, what's supposed to happen? I'm supposed to uncover the secret. I'm supposed to be exposed to my real will. So in that case, Rav Cook, in some way, he was a psychoanalyst of secularism. He tried to read what is the subconscious passion of secularism that's in contrast to the awareness of secularism. Now, this is how, this, so, so this is a very important part of Rav Cook's theology. How can you uncover the subconscious passion of secular Zionists? So, I mean, just, so there's many, many moves here. Let me present two of them, okay? Let me present two of them. I want to use Kabbalah a little bit, okay? He creates a, syn a synthesis between Hegelian philosophy and Kabbalah, and it works like this. According to the way Hegel is understood and was understood, the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, is that um, every nation, a nation has a spirit within the nation, has a spirit. And the biography of the nation is the biography of the spirit of the nation that is living through that nation. And the history of the nation is actually the biography of the spirit of the, of the nation actualizing himself through the events of that nation. Now, Rav Kook took the ocean. Yeah, every nation, so, which means, by the way, that every nation has a spirit, and every individual of that nation, what is it? Every individual of the nation is one. Man, is a, is a, like, you see, the, all, the, some of the individuals, it's like a privatization of the spirit of the nation, and together they are creating the spirit of the nation. Now, that idea of having every nation having a spirit which is larger and greater and has its own personality that's larger than the sum of its individuals, has its own personality. That European idea is an idea that using Kabbalistic categories makes a lot of sense. You see, according to the Kabbalah now, the Kabbalah is one of the only bodies of knowledge within Jewish tradition that tries to understand God but tries to understand um, the um, God has two parts to it. Tzad anistar va tzad anigle. Only the um, tzad anigle, how would you say that? The revealed aspect of divinity is revealed through 10 categories. So how do we call those categories? Sfirot, eser sfirot blima. And every sfira has within it a certain aspect the Mekubalim always say, Kiv yachol, meaning this is language that it will only be useful if you don't take it too seriously. I'm serious. Like, it's like, I think it's true about language in general, but for the Kabbalists, it's very important to emphasize that these words will make sense only if you don't take them too seriously, only if they don't capture all the sense, all the meaning. So one of the Sfirot is Sfirat Malchut. It's one of God's aspects. Sfirat Malchut is the tenth Sfira, has many names. One of the names of Sfirat Malchut is Knesset Israel. Now, anyone that knows a little bit of Midrashim, like Midrash Shira Shirim, knows that Knesset Israel is also the name of what? Of the Jewish collective. Let me just put this together. If Sfirat Malchut is a representation of God's light, and Sfirat Malchut is a rep representation of the Jewish collective. What does that mean? 
What does that mean? That the Jewish collective is Sfirat Malchut. Did you follow this? And if the Jewish collect, so, so Rav Cook maybe uses a Hegelian category to understand this. When it comes to the Jews, the national spirit of the Jews is Sfirat Malchut. Let me say it simply, in a more simple way. When it comes to Jews, the national spirit of Jews is divine. Did you follow this move? You sure? It's a little bit weird stuff. Okay. So the national spirit of Jews is divine. Now, if you accept this, that the national spirit of Judaism, of the Jews, is divine, so if I'm a patriot immigrating to Israel, building kibbutzim, giving my life to the Jewish people, going to the army, fighting in the army, trying to speak in the language of the Jewish spirit in Hebrew. I'm doing all that. Devotion to the Jewish people is not a substitute to devotion for God. What is it? It is devotion to God. Let me say this again. If the spirit of the Jewish collective is Sfirat Malchut, I'm using now the Kabbalistic tradition to establish, I'm the Rav Kook now, I use the Kabbalistic tradition to establish that, that the spirit of the Jewish nation is divine, so, secu- so secular Zionists that decide that they're devoting their lives to the Jewish nation, they are devoting their life because the, Jew- the spirit of the Jewish nation is divine, they are effectively devoting their lives to God. So now let's think about so I'm a Zionist and I'm secular. What does that mean? That I'm replacing religion with nationalism. But mystically speaking, you can't replace religion with nationalism because when you turn your back to God and you're saying, I'm not religious, and instead of national, what are you doing? By doing that, you're serving God. But you think that your national awareness your national passion is a replacement for your religious devotion. Okay, that's what you think. That's what you think. But anyone that studied Ghazai Torah, says Rav Kook, the secrets of the Torah can know that subconsciously your devotion to Am Israel, to the, to the, to the people of Israel, is a devotion to Elohei Israel. Subconsciously, you're rebelling against God, and subconsciously, you're returning to God. You see, once the spirit of the nation of Israel is divine, you can't really separate between an act of patriotism and an act of religious devotion, because any act of patriotism is an act of religious devotion. After I do this Kabbalistic move, I can't separate my Zionism from my religion, because my Zionism is my religion. My devotion to the people is not separate from my relationship with God. My devotion to the people is a part of my relationship with God. And to bring this all back home, so the prophet says, yeah, there's going to be a double tshuva. The tshuva to Eretz Yisrael and the tshuva to Elohei Yisrael. What is, so Rav Kook comes around and says, how does this work? that the tshuva to Eretz Yisrael is not added to the tshuva to Elohei Yisrael. That is a part of the process of the tshuva to the God of Israel, to Elohei Yisrael. I want to add more. Now I want to use a different theology. Rav Kook has many, many faces. Rav Kook's definition for God is that God is what you can't put in any definition. That's the definition. It's beyond any definition. It can't be captured with words. It can't be captured with images. It can't be captured with concepts. God is beyond any concept. So this means that if God has no boundaries, so a religious passion to get close to God is actually a passion for what? to break all boundaries. Did you follow this? Therefore, 
when Jews feel suffocated in halakha and they want to break the boundaries of halakha, why are they doing that? They're doing that not because they overcame their passion for God, it's because they are experiencing their passion for God. Let's say this move one more time, okay? If God is what's beyond any boundary, so your passion to get close to God is a, bash, is a passion to break all boundaries. Therefore, if you have a generation of Jews that feel suffocated by the law, by halakha, and they want to break all the halakha, that, anarchiz, that, a, that anarchism of this, gener this generation is the aliyah and the aliyah nishit. That anarchism of this generation is not anti-religious energy, it's religious energy. It's pure religious energy. Meaning, sec secularism is a form of religious passion. There's only one. So I just gave you two different ways to think about sec secular Zionism as subconscious religiosity, where the suffocation of halacha comes from religious passion. Nationalism is a manifestation of religious passion. The only people that, that, that don't know that what really motivates them is a religious motivation is secular Jews. So if that's the case, what's the difference between a religious Jew and a secular Jew? What's the only difference? Self-awareness. That my anti-halachic sentiment comes from my yearning for God. When that will be exposed, we'll have to start reading. There'll be a new interpretation for halacha. This is also part of it'll be a, what Rav Kook calls a prophetic interpretation of halacha. We're moving to bait rishon, to prophecy, not bait sheni, wisdom. So you see, everything works out. It's all in harmony, right? <laughs> everything works out. The return to the land is not, is not, and the return to God is not different. It's the same process. Secular Zionism is subconsciously the greatest form of religious Zionism. In Al Tohar, in a great work of Rav Kook, he writes, Hanefesh shel poshei Israel hi hayoter gvoha minafsham shel shlomei emunei Israel. It's unbelievable that an Orthodox rabbi says this. That the soul of the sinners of Israel comes from a higher place than the soul of shlomei emunei Israel, the frum Orthodox rabbis. Because think, uh, yeah, just, just let's put this together. If the spirit of our nation is divine, what is a Galut Jew in that case? A Jew that doesn't do anything to promote redemption, that's not doing anything active to save other Jews, that's not coming to Israel, not speaking the national language, not going to the army, not building communities, not strengthening the nation. So that use Rav Cook's Kabbalistic categories to explain that Jew? What is he or she? There's something less religious about them. The more religious or less religious, and the less religious are more religious. Now, maybe if, if we understand these categories, we can understand the following amazing line. Rav Cook's son, the Rav Tzivah, used to say that a soldier wearing the, um, his uniform, those uniforms are holy and sacred, like the uniform of the high priest in Yom Kippur. Now that sounds crazy, but if you use these categories, why does a high priest in Yom Kippur wear his uniform? To serve, to serve God. When you go to the army wearing that uniform, what are you doing? By serving the Jewish people in light of the deification of the spirit of the Jewish people, you are serving God. So we have two models of religious Zionism. The coexistence model and this very radical united theory where my Zionism and my religion are all, both aspects of the same thing. That my, by, by my national devotion is religious devotion. It's not something added to it. It's the same thing. So the Talmud says that the Messiah will come either in, in a generation that everyone is righteous or that everyone is sinner. So if you, want, if you really want the Messiah to come, if you get all the Jews in the world to be sinners, then he will come. <laughs> or the alternative is to get all the Jews in the world to obey the mitzvot. Choose your path. <laughs> now, so Rav Cook writes in 190, 
I think 1905 or 1906, he writes, This generation, the second Aliyah, 1905, It's an amazing generation. It's, an, it's a nation that, it's a generation that leaves you perplexed. And he says, So the Talmud said that the, that the Messiah will come either a generation where everyone is zakai or a generation that's chayav. And Rav Kook says, this generation is at the same time. Kulo zakai, kulo chayav. Because everyone here is sinners and everyone is righteous at the same time. Because if you follow what I said, the act of sinning is itself, itself an act of righteousness. And an act of righteousness of me obeying halacha that makes me passive here in the galut, that's an act of righteousness and it's an act of sinning. I think what Rav Cook did, he took the Hasidic notion that everything has a divine spark in it, and he uses that, but he implies that notion on modern ideologies, saying socialism, socialism has something sacred in it. Nationalism has something sacred in it. Secularism has something sacred in it. And our role is to bring everything back to its source. So I would say, yeah, this is a third take on Rav Kook. It's a third take, a Hasidic take on Rav Kook. So I think Rav Kook, yes, he would say, exactly, a ballet can be empty from holiness, but with watch, observing the ballet with the right set of eyes, it's filled with holiness. So I guess subconsciously, I, I presented three different interpretations of Rav, uh, takes on the Rav Kook. The Kabbalistic one, meaning seeing the Jewish people as the spirit of the Jewish people as divine and therefore devo national devotion is religious devotion. That was one move. The second move is that um, if God is beyond boundaries, so kirvat Elohim, the passion to get close to God is experienced as a passion to break all boundaries and that's why negation of halacha could come not from, set, from rejection of religion but as a expression of religious passion. And my third take is that Rav Kook is a Hasid. His role, he, he's implying what the Hasidut did in the 18th century to the ideologies of the 19th century and the 20th century. I want to take this conversation to Rav Kook's son. These thoughts, which are hard to comprehend, hard to understand, Rav Kook thought that this kind of theology is going to work. He's coming to Palestine, to a land where Jews don't get along with each other, because the Yeshuva Yashan, who are the Yeshuva Yashan? Ultra-Orthodox Jews, they are, ironically, the most Galut Jews live in Eretz Yisrael. And the reason, and so the most, so the people from the Aliyah come to escape Galut, and they meet the worst, the, the most Galut Jew here in Palestine. Here is in Palestine, obviously. And their conflict, the Yeshuva Yashan, think that the Yeshuva, you see, there is a theology expressed in the Midrash and the Chmanides that the entire Torah is only meant to be kept in Eretz Yisrael. All the halacha, it only works in the land of Israel. So why are you supposed to obey halacha outside of Israel? So you won't forget it when we return. So by the, this understanding created throughout the generations, Jews didn't want to come to Eretz Yisrael. Why? Because only here, where God is observing you, so you really have to be strict with halacha. So the only Jews that were drawn to Eretz Yisrael were Jews who were willing to be very strict with halacha. So Israel was, Palestine was a, a magnet for Jews which were extremely observant. And that realized the responsibility. They believed metaphysically that you learn Torah and Eretz Yisrael in some way that cures the whole world. So you go to Israel to live a completely sacred life. You give up your own will. You obey to halacha. You study Torah. That's what you do in Eretz Yisrael. Which means what the Zionists would see as the worst form of galut is experienced, and it can only be experienced metaphysically in Eretz Yisrael. Now think about how the Yeshuv, that's how the Yeshuv Chadash sees the Yeshuv Yashan. How do the Yeshuvah Yashan, the Haredim, see the Yeshuvah Chadash? How do they see them? Where? What? Where did they come to violate the halacha? 
In the land of Halacha? Where did they come to rebel against God? In the land observed by God? There's nothing worse than secularism in Eretz Israel from the point of view of the Yeshuvah HaYashan, and there's nothing worse than being living Galut Judaism in Eretz Israel from the point of view of the Yeshuvah Hadash. So you can understand how they understood each other, right? So the clash between the pioneers and the ultra-Orthodox living here was a very, very violent, culturally speaking, but not only culturally speaking, clash. Rav Kook comes in 1904 with this theology where everyone has room, where the secular Jews are actually religious Jews, and the religious Jews need to make room for secular Jews. And this theology will enable both sides to understand each other. They'll all understand each other because they'll all understand Rav Kook's theolo sophisticated theology, internalize Rav Kook's sophisticated theology, and as a result, we'll be able to live together in harmony and coexistence. So he comes here with this theology that can make sense out of impossible sociology of Palestine. Did it work? <laughs> Did it work? Here's what happens. So the Yeshuvah Hadash, the pioneers, they look at Rav Kook and what do they see? They see an ultra-Orthodox Jew, which all his halacha, halachic um, psikot, uh, or ultra-Orthodox, he's a halachic Jew, we have, and he's ultra-Orthodox, so they, they didn't want, the, they were against him. The ultra-Orthodox Jews, many of them read his writings where he glorifies secular Judaism and secular Jews, and they, they would have nothing to do with him. So he came here to create a theology that will, that will connect to everyone what actually happened was that he himself found himself isolated from both tribes, from both camps. He dies in 1935, where his theology didn't make a difference in Palestine. And by the way, oh, and religious Zionism? They admired him, but they did not internalize his theology. He himself was not a member of the Mizrahi. He was not a member of Nakiva. He was not a part of religious Zionism. He dies in 1935, where the dominant, in 1935, when the dominant theology of religious Zionism is the coexistence one. This coexistence theology created a tribe of religious Zionists that were suffering from a very deep sense of inferiority complex. Why would they, they feel inferior? Inferior towards who? Religious Zionists always felt that they're less religious than the Haredim. And they always felt that they're less Zionists than the Chilonim. It's a double inferiority complex. And as a result, religious Zionists, when they felt real Torah, is in the Haredi Yeshivot. Real rabbis are Haredi rabbis. Real Zionists are in secular kibbutzim. Real Zionists are secular Jews. They felt like Nebechs. We're not really Israelis, we're not really religious, we're like somewhere in the middle, and it was a very not charming, charismatic tribe. The Rhinus theology created a lot of inferiority in the hearts and minds of religious Zionists. Yosef Bulg, one of the leaders of political, of religious Zionism, was asked once, Matem yoter, tzionut o datit? And he answered with a Yiddish accent, Anachnu hamakaf. We are the, um, the dash, the hyphen. We're like, you know, you know. It was a very nebuchish identity. In the 1970s, something happens. In the 1970s, religious Zionism starts changing their theology. They move from a Rhinus theology to a Cookian theology. Now when Cookian theology kicks in, and they start understanding their religious Zionism, not as, I'm also religious, I'm also a Zionist, but my Zionism is passionately religious. Suddenly, now, I'm more of a Zionist than secular Israelis. And by the way, I'm more really religious than the Haredim that don't do the army, because not going to the army is not a problem with their Zionism, now it's a problem with what? With their religion. And now, I feel in some sense superior as a Zionist, the secular Zionist, and superior religiously 
the Haredi Israelis, and now something big happens in the 70s, religious Zionism starts becoming passionate and charismatic. Let's fast forward this. What happens to religious Zionism in the 90s? Let's say this is the 21st century, okay? This represents Zionism. Zionism led mostly by who? By the triple synthesis of secularism, Zionism, and socialism. This idea is the dominant idea of Zionism until when? This triple synthesis we discussed yesterday of nationalism, secularism, and socialism created the political force and the social force that led Zionism from 1906 until 73 was a blow, 70, was a military blow, 77 a political blow. In the 70s, it starts shaking. But socialist, secular Zionism was the force, I'm speaking now about ideas, not about, was the force, the ideas that led Zionism. Religious Zionism was in the periphery of socialist Zionism. And Rav Cook was in the periphery you understand these three arrows? <laughs> Rav Cook theology was in the periphery of religious Zionism, which was in the periphery of Zionism. In the 1970s, Rav Cook Zionism becomes moved from the periphery of religious Zionism to the center of religious Zionism. As a result, religious Zionism are now loaded with new energy, and they start, as a result, to find their way towards the center of Zionism itself. Some think that they're going to lead Zionism. So if Bapai is the engine of the train of Zionism, the religious Zionists are what? Kaboos. Who's the Kaboos? The last one. Okay, so the Kaboos, they're the Mashgiach they're the Mashgiach Kashrut. They're the, um, they're the uh, kosher supervisors. Now the question is, some people in Israel feel like it's very possible in the 21st century what's going to happen. They're going to replace the Qatar, the engine. I'm a skeptic about that. But what we do see a story about a powerful idea where Rav Cook's theology dies in 1935 and his ideas in the periphery of religious Zionism. In the 1970s, it moves from the periphery to the center of religious Zionism, radically changing religious Zionism. And now this new idea that liberates you from the double inferiority complex, creates pride, passion, and charisma, and leads this tribe towards the center of Zionism itself. This is a story about the power of an idea, of moving from Rhinist Zionism to Cookian Zionism. You know what? Does anybody want to ask me what happened in the 70s? What happened in the 70s? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. What happened to the 70s? Yeah? Israel became very, very close to the 73 is a Okay. So 73 is definitely a moment. And 67 is definitely a moment. And uh, 77. Okay. What happens in 1967? Now, these are two events that completely transform religious Zionism. What happens in 1967? So this is a story that you all know, but I want to look at it from, the point, from a theological point of view. Before the war, before 1967, about two or three weeks, Jews around the world and in Israel were sure that's what's going to happen. What? Second holiday. 1964, there's a war between Egypt and Yemen. Egypt uses gas, or at least that's the rumors that were in, Pal in Israel at the time, that they used gas against Yemen, that creates horrible, horrible associations. We're on the verge of destruction. We have in Ramad Gan, you know the safari in Ramad Gan, where the zoo is? All that land, all that land was designated before 67 to be a graveyard for civilians. It was perceived by many Israelis we're on the verge of destruction. Also American Jews thought we're on the verge of destruction. And then the war happens, and in six days, 
we triple our size and destroy four armies and in five hours destroy the Egyptian Air Force. And that moved from being on the verge of destruction to tripling our size, destroying armies. That was a transition. It was hard to comprehend. And what was the reaction among Jews around the world, among Israelis in Israel? What was the reaction to that transition from being almost destroyed to tripling our size? And not only tripling our size, returning to Jerusalem, returning to Hebron, returning to Bethlehem, returning to Shechem. In six days, our world was created all over again. It was a biblical miracle. It seemed like a miracle, like, like Exodus, like one of those miracles that you can't believe that it just happened. But it was the return to the Bible, not only because we had, our world was created in six days in an event that echoes the biblical miracles, we were also returned to biblical land, to Yerushalayim, to Bethlehem, to Shechem. We're back in the Bible. This is it. And suddenly, Zionism seemed like an idea that we can't just understand it using secular categories. It seemed like a historic movement that we can't just use political language, secular language, to understand it. The only language that enabled those people at that moment to express what they were feeling was messianic language. And guess who had messianic language already there waiting for someone to use it? Rav Kook. Suddenly, the Rhinus narrative wasn't useful anymore. And the Rav Kook narrative started to seem very authentic, very real. But even after that, even after a six-day war, where people were looking for language to express what they were feeling, the euphoria of those years, religious Zionists still felt that, yeah, maybe this is the theology, but we still can't lead Israel. Because the labor icons like Moshe Dayan, Rabin, like these icons, they were adored and admired, and they're the responsible adults. They're the ones supposed to lead Israel. They're the ones who are supposed to lead Zionism. We don't have a role in leading Israel. And then 1973 happens. And what 1973 was the moment that people had an awakening after, after the Yom Kippur War, realizing maybe the Dayans of, they don't know what they're doing. Maybe these responsible adults are like our, in some sense, our political parents. Maybe they have no idea how to lead. You put 67 and 73 together, and what comes out? In 67, we discovered that maybe our theology, messianic theology, we got it right. And in 73, we realized that their leadership got it wrong. As a result, it's our theology and our people that need to lead Israel. Where was the moment where religious Zionists start, ex start really expressing the fact that the leadership of Israel is now in our hands? Where is that moment? Where do they start, where they start to really, they just start really to be played out? In 1975, what are we talking about? The beginning of the settler movement, where a group of settlers infused by Rav Kook messianic theology climbed to mountaintops in the Samaria, in a place called Sebastia, and the labor government didn't want, us, didn't want them there. So they uprooted them, and then they came back. They were uprooted again, and after seven times, labor government gave in, and they built their first settlement on a mountaintop in the heart of the Samaria. We're back to the Bible. We're back in the Samaria. And you see, this is an important move. Because the people that found the settlements in the Samaria, you know what they were thinking? They thought, it's true that the government doesn't want us here. But we know something. Who subconsciously really wants us here? You're thinking God like, like, a, like not a cookie and Jew. 
Who really wants us here? Uh, God, Israel. God, yeah, yeah. The nation of Israel that maybe consciously don't want us here, subconsciously they really want us here. And we are going to implement not their conscious will, we are going to implement not what they say they want, not what they think they want, but what they really want. So in Sebastian, I'm not rebelling against the people. I am implementing the true will of the people because I know what they really want because I'm using Kabbalistic categories learned by the Rav Kook to understand what they really want. And this is a moment of leadership. You see, in 1909, secular social Zionism went to Dganya, founded a kibbutz, and then many kibbutzim followed them. They went to Encharod, many followed them. In the 20s, Luzer Zionists say, hey, we can be socialists too. So they create Hakibutz Hadati, which is saying we are wannabes. They have kibbutzim, we could also have kibbutzim. They go to the army, we'll do Hezdel. We'll always be just like them. We're following them. In Sebastia 1975, it was the first time the religious Zionist says, we're going to build settlements in the Samaria, and guess what's going to happen in a few years? They're going to follow us. They'll come out here. There might be 400,000 Jews living in these mountains one day. It's not a number I just picked, that's the number then. That's there today. That's the moment where they decided we're not going to be led by secular socialism. We're going to lead. In 67, that validated the theology. In 73, that destroyed the myth of the leadership, creates the new passion, superiority, charisma of religious Zionists. The important th spiritual leader of this movement was the son of the Rav Kook. What was his name? Rav Tzvi Yudha. Now Rav Tzvi Yudha, very different, this is different than his father. But this is, this is how he understood it. And I want a very a simple explanation of Rav Tzvi Yudha. The prophets of Israel have a vision of the future. And this is how the vision will look like, according to the prophecies. One day, the people of Israel will gather and return to the land of Israel. Then they will build settlements in Israel and revive the ancient mountains of Samaria. This actually says in the Bible. Then they will, the way Rav Tzvi Yudah interprets it, their, their sovereignty will expand and expand. Later on, the next stages of the Messianic process will continue. This is what it says in the Bible. Now we look at history and what do we see? The Jewish people are returning to the land of Israel. The Six-Day War, they return to the biblical land of Israel. They are starting to settle the land of Israel, meaning in front of our eyes what is happening. The ancient prophecies are fulfilling themselves. And now it's very easy to make the following conclusion. If all the prophecies until now have fulfilled themselves, what does that mean? That all the prophecies from now will continue to fulfill themselves. After the Sixth Day War, Rav Tzvi Yudha said, we're not in the beginning of redemption, we're in the middle of the, redemption, the process of redemption. Now let's think about this. Who's going to the army, fighting the wars, building settlements, and guarding settlements till now? Re secular Zionism. Again, the people that are fulfilling the Messianic dream are the ones that are not believing in a Messianic dream. The people that are implementing the prophecies are the ones that don't even believe that prophecy exists. How is that possible? Well, let's be the Freudian, psycho, cookie, Freudian cookie and psychoanalyst again. I want to read their will, not through their words, but through their deeds. And if in their words they, d they deny the existence of a messianic plan, but in their deeds, they are implementing the messianic plan. What does that mean? What? Subconsciously. They subconsciously believe it, of course. Of course they do. In light of all this, messianic narrative is supposed to expand. The next stages 
of the prophecies are supposed to implement themselves. And here's something that can't happen according to the theory. What can't happen according to this theory? What can't happen? Regression and pulling out people. And that's why in 2005, Rav Tzvida was long gone, but his, 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 his students were there. They weren't saying the heat natkut, the disengagement. They weren't saying asul shetiyat natkut. They weren't saying there shouldn't be a disengagement from Gaza. They, what, they, what did they say? They say No, they didn't say cannot. It just won't happen. It won't happen. You should know it's not going to happen. And people that were in rallies in 2005, Together we're yelling, what were they yelling? Monsieur there? What kind of Hayo <laughs> Loti? It's not going to happen. It won't happen. It can't happen. In the last moment, secular nationalism cannot turn against the messianic plan. It can't. Because the because if it will, what does that mean? That the theory doesn't work. And the theory has to work. Why? Because, of course, it works. <laughs> so, okay, so 2005 couldn't happen, and there's only one problem. It did. It did. And 2005 is a blow to Messianic religious Zionism. 2000, the designation from Gaza and the fact that maybe, se see, according to the theory, this is what's supposed to happen. Na secular nationalism, what's supposed to happen is that nationalism is religiosity disguised. So what will happen is that nationalism will transform secularism and turn into religious. What really happened? That secularism transformed nationalism. And it became less national, liberal, individualist, it's not that nationalism changed secularism, it's that secularism changed nationalism. The theory of Rav Cook and his son doesn't work. The evacuation of Gaza is for Messianic Zionism, what the privatization of the kibbutz is for socialist Zionism. It's, these are events that can't happen in theory, and when they happen, they shake the idea. They're shaking the theory. Religious Zionism there was an idea in the periphery of religious Zionism, and religious Zionism was the periphery of Zionism. In the 1970s, this idea moved from the periphery to the center. Religious Zionism is trying to move to the center, and right when they almost got there, events happened that were a blow to the idea. Today, religious Zionism has a lot of energy, but how do we glue religion and Zionism? The Zionist model doesn't work. The messianic glue doesn't work for many. This is a crisis. It's not a, social, it's not a sociological crisis. It's a crisis of an idea. It's when an idea seems not to work. Anymore. Religious Zionism is, in Israel has turning into a very powerful force in Israel. But it's facing a crisis. It's not a sociological crisis. It's a crisis in its ideas. Some of its ideas, I think, are breaking down. And what I try to show today is an alternative religious Zionism, a religious Zionism that works not, not using a, a messianic category, but using other categories. As I try to explain, maybe religious, what makes religious Zionism make sense is not the interpretation of Zionism as a part of a messianic plan, but maybe what gives religious value to Zionism is the opportunity that is presented in front of Judaism just by the fact that we're not in Galut, we're not in exile anymore. So as opposed to a Zion that has religious value because of it's a part of a messianic process, I presented a Zionism that has religious value because Judaism has a great chance to prevail in circumstances where we're not in exile.